Uh, quick reminder, please shut off your cell phones. And for those of you that didn't notice, join us following the event in the lobby. Explore is here selling uh, copies of In Other Rooms, Other Wonders. My name is Natalie Lacey, and I'm the Programs Manager for the Aspen Writers Foundation. Thank you for joining us for the fourth event in our 15th annual Winter Word Series. I would like to begin by extending a huge thank you to all of you, to our community. Without your support, nothing would be possible. This is our fourth jam-packed Winter Words event. And while reports indicate that reading and writing are in perilous decline throughout our nation, these sold out venues are solid proof that in our community, reading and writing are on the upswing. I would also like to thank our wonderful board, our members, the AWF staff, the sponsors and partners that make tonight's event happen, including the City of Aspen, the Aspen Times, Aspen Peak Magazine, Ross Cribs and the Nugget Gallery, Christine Gershell and Les Dames d'Aspen, Colorado Creative Industries, Aspen Public Radio, Aspen Skiing Company, Farias Properties, and Pomeroy Sports. And of course, Laura Whitley. Daniel Muinadin is the kind of person who gives faith to all those who dream of a second act. He began writing in earnest at the age of 39. After first managing his fa father's family farm in rural Pakistan and practicing corporate law in New York City. When his debut story collection, In Other Rooms, came out to thunderous applause and a deluge of honors, it was enough to turn even his seemingly hard to pronounce surname, Muinadine, into a household name, at least among savvy fiction fans. Securing the story prize, being a finalist for the U.S. Literary Trifecta, the Pulitzer, National Book Award, and the L.A. Times Book Award, and earning comparisons to Chekhov and Faulkner, in other rooms, quickly put him on the map. Muinadine has acknowledged a desire to finesse cultural differences in his writing so that what remains are the human sides of a story, characters that earn the empathy of their readers. The author's duty is to present the characters in all their reality and humanity, to go far inside the characters so you are no longer in a position to, do, to judge, says he. It is this creative process, this exploratory journey into the heart of writing, and the power it has when it's shared throughout the world that we at the Aspen Writers Foundation wholeheartedly embrace. And with that, it is my pleasure and my extreme honor to introduce to you Daniel Muinadin. Thank you. I have to figure this thing out first. At least attach it to myself. Um, uh, okay, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to be reading you two bits from a story that's going to be coming out. It's not a story, a memoir piece that's going to be coming out soon in The New Yorker. And it's this, the piece that I'm going to be reading you is uh, about how I took over my farm, my father's farm in Pakistan. Uh, basically, my, my, I've got a sort of an odd story. Um, I was uh, brought up in Pakistan. Uh, my father it was a sort of a government servant and also a quote-unquote uh, feudal landlord. Um, well, exactly, very PC. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so at the age of 13, I was shipped off to a boarding school, um, which was a traumatic experience having uh, enjoyed all the liberties of being the son of a feudal landlord. Um, <laughs> and, and then went off to college in America. And in my last year in college, I started receiving these sort of impassioned letters from my father, who was not a particularly passionate man, uh, suggesting that I needed to come back to Pakistan. Uh, he, of course, was afraid that I would 
escape to the flesh pots of the West and uh, never see him again. Um, so the, the gist of his letters was, uh, my, we are losing our farm, and if you don't come back and rescue it, then it's not going to belong to us any longer. And this was actually true, because he was, my, he was 30 years older than my mother, and he was an old man by the time I was graduating college. And the farm was very far from the, where he lived. He lived in Lahore, and it's nine hours by road to my farm. And therefore, the managers of the farm had basically declared independence, or were in the process of doing that. As a, as a former colony, you, all of you will recognize the, the, the impulse to do this. Um, so he, so in any case, I uh, sort of, at the age of 23, uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, um, went off to this farm. And of course, the guys who were in the process of taking control of the farm were not too thrilled when I showed up. Um, so I will start by just reading you the first couple of paragraphs of this. At a town, not even a town, a crossroad, with two samosa stands and a cigarette shop, my driver turns off the KLP road, Karachi, Lahore, Peshawar, and onto the Shahi road, the Royal Road, the Nawab of Bahawalpur's road. Each time I make this trip, this will be the moment when I know that I've come home. We skirt the desert to our south, Indian, Rajasthan, and Jaisalmer, not more than three hours away through the dunes, if the border had not been closed for decades. Moving quickly now, as if surging toward food and rest, having driven eight hours already down to the farm, where I will live much of my life these next 25 years. This was cane country, canal country, Country well entered, white from salt on waterlogged flats, elsewhere green, drawing you into its center. From the canal headworks, running five kilometers to the boundary of the bit of property that my grandfather bought on spec in 1916 and never once visited, there were only two or three pieces of cultivated land, little scraps, when I showed up that day with my fresh minted Dartmouth degree in English Lit back in 1987, exactly. <laughs> what do you do with an English lit degree, right? Go run a farm. <laughs> <laughs> Today, from the headworks to my farm and 35 kilometers on to the Indus, where the plain ends, there is hardly a patch of ground large enough to pitch a tent that is not cropped to cotton or sugarcane, mangoes or wheat. This was the last wild place in the Punjab, and I watched its wildness fade the Rajasthani colors almost lost. The Mahars, the nomadic desert people, have bought land now, selling their herds. So that's the, that's the beginning of that. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, a lot of people ask me, or people often ask me, I, because I became a writer so late in my life, what caused me to become a writer? And um, so I'm going to just explore the answer to this question a little bit for the next few minutes. Um, I've, I've told you about my history, uh, about having come to America and then having gone back to Pakistan. Um, the one thing that I didn't mention is that there was this amazing moment when I was at college where I one day went to the mirror to shave. In those days, one used like a, you know, this single blade thing. And, uh, and I went and looked in the mirror as I was shaving. And looking back at me, it was a poet. Um, so I decided to become a poet. Um, <laughs> uh, and so although I was farming all these years, I was also writing poetry. And th but th there was a sort of a revelational moment where after having screwed up my courage, uh, say four or five or two years, I guess about a couple of years in, I decided that I would, sh my father is a well-read man, and I decided to show him my poems. So I showed, sent him, gave him a little packet of poems, and uh, then you know, went somewhere else and hoped that he would read them. And when I went to have tea with him, he said to me, uh, first of all, he didn't say anything, and I was sweating, so sweat coming down, and my collar is wet. Um, and finally I said, so, so Dad, did you read my poems? And he said, uh, Daniel, I'll tell you this. 
Six generations of our family have written poetry, including you, all of them badly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was when I realized that that was not, I was not, I I'd hoped I was going to sort of inscribe my name in the skies as a, po a poet, which of course is the highest calling, but I didn't. Um, so, so the question then is, why is it that uh, having had this long period in which I, having decided that I wasn't going to become a poet and having been a farmer, why is it that I made the decision to become a writer? And for me, it was very consciously a decision. Uh, I was working in one of these large and supposedly, and in fact, in fact, horrible law firms um, in New York City and, and, and working amazing hours, which were <laughs> not amazing to me. Um, and, and, uh, and one day I just decided that I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be a writer and I'd rather be a second rate, unfulfilled, unrespected, um, unsuccessful writer than to be a reasonably good lawyer. Um, and and it, was, it was really a watershed. It was actually one of those moments in life when you're sort of 40 years old. I suppose some people buy Ferraris, but I instead decided that I would go off and write fiction. Um, uh, <laughs> So the question is, what caused me to make this decision? Uh, the first thing I think is a, a deep nostalgia. Um, I was torn from my home. Uh, I lived this idyllic childhood in which we were either in Lahore where we lived we, I lived this carefree life in this large, crazy house. And one, uh, one time this American friend of ours, a friend of my father's, came to my house and decided that he would count how many people were actually living in the house. And, and he actually found there was something like 100 people living there um, <laughs> in, in, in sort of nooks and crannies. And, 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 and they were, you know, they had their, I mean, my father knew nothing of this. My father, every month, would be sort of waving the food bills in the air and saying, who's eating all this food? <laughs> and every, everybody would sort of look, look a little sort of into the air. <laughs> um, so, so, but because of that, I was, you know, um, living all, because as a child, you're allowed to move, you know, I was used to play with the kids who were playing, living in the house or the kids who lived outside the house. And so I moved between these, all these different strata in the house. My father n only, was only vaguely aware that of the sort of the all of the tremendously rich life that was taking place in the house. But I, as a kid, was very aware of it because I hung out with those people. I, was, I went to the back of the house where you know, there were these, these sort of quarters and all this. Um, and, and then I came to America. And then when I went back after Dartmouth, suddenly I was excluded from that world. Um, I was, now I was the one in charge. And the, the sort of open arms and sunny smiles had turned into either, uh, turned into you know, ingratiating smiles. Uh, and I could no longer access that world. And for me, that, that was a true expulsion from a s very sunny place. And I think that part of what drives my writing, therefore, is a desire to somehow get back to that place for which I'm so nostalgic. And I think that all writers have a story of being in exile in some way or another. But certainly for me, that was the exile that counted. The second thing that I think create, causes me to be a writer, caused me to make that choice, is that I, I'm, I'm, I exist between two worlds. Um, my, my wife laughs at me because we, we, we hop into an airplane and uh, from New York. And somewhere over Uzbekistan, my uh, accent starts to change. <laughs> and, and, and she looks at me and says, darling, you're doing it again. Um, <laughs> uh, so I have this you know, divided identity. I've been very much part of two worlds. And as a farmer especially, I've been very deeply embedded in a very Pakistani world. Um, I think if you, if you, you people today, well, first I can just put it this way. Um, the, the people on my farm who unfortunately have come to learn that I'm a writer think of it as a slightly sort of shameful thing and, and they're afraid to mention it to me because and they know, they assume I must be a little sensitive on this subject that 
but he's sort of writing books. I mean, who writes books? And, and, and so, so, so there, um, th I don't, can't at all lean on, the, on, the, on my s s quote unquote laurels. Um, there, I'm very much, it's something that I don't talk about because, uh, especially because I'm writing about them. And, and <laughs> they would, <laughs> they're, they're, it's impossible to write about people without them having, thinking that, no matter if you describe them as leaping tall buildings and sort of looking like Rob Redford, they still think you've not done them justice. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so I try to keep it low profile on that, sub on that count. Um, uh, my mother was a writer. She um, wrote short stories and wrote really good ones. I think she used to always say to me um, that I, it's, it's a quote I think from Voltaire, um, but I could be wrong, uh, uh, but about the attribution. But what she used to say is, the, the writer says, I write, I tell as much truth as I can and each day I can tell more and more. And, and that, I think, was what limited her. That I think that she had been so traumatized, perhaps, uh, by as a, as a woman, who, as an American woman, going to Pakistan and not understanding the culture and trying to understand it, that she couldn't bear to tell enough of the truth. And therefore, when I became a writer, it, it was, in a way, a further expression of her own impulse to write. Um, uh, that I, I became a writer in it partly because she she had wanted herself to be one. There's a wonderful story about John Updike, um, which is that his mother was also a writer, and uh, Updike, some reporter, came, uh, Updike had won some honor, and uh, s a reporter went up to the um, uh, Mrs. Updike, you know, Updike Mayor, and said. Um, so, Mrs. Updike, you must be so proud of John. You know, he's done so well. And she said, oh, yes, I'm very proud of him, but I wish it had been me. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> so, so it's always a little complicated when you, yeah. when you, when you achieve your parents' dreams. Um, but in any case, so, so the, uh, another aspect of my having chose become a writer is that, uh, is that I have this dis divided identity. Um, Finally, uh, I think part of my project is that I'm trying to translate Pakistan for a Western audience. I am entirely uh, imbued with the writers of the Western canon. I don't read very often the Pakistani writers. I mean, th what I read is the, the American classics. I'm a very boring reader. I read, you know, Chekhov and Turgenev, and, uh, you know, all, all those things. Uh, but, and, and my language, my the language in which I can communicate properly is English. My, my, my wife has just begun studying Urdu, and she has this, well, she has, you know, this teacher, and they come and they do all these lessons. And she will say to me, so darling, what does this word mean? Which is some like philosophical word, like you know, entity or being or something. I say, I don't know, I have the foggiest idea. <laughs> because the only words I know are the words for like wheat and cotton and tractors and <laughs> <laughs> um, so I couldn't I couldn't write in uh, in Urdu. And and yet what I'm doing is I'm translating these these the lives of these people and the colours and the the ways of being Pakistani for people who don't know it. And I am, I think, can be an, a bridge to carry that message. And it's not a message, there's nothing, you know, it's not that I have any message, that, uh, political or otherwise, but what I do have is the ability to look at Pakistan and to tell you folks what it looks like. And for me, that's a very powerful position. I like to do it. I like ha being in that central place. And uh, I know that sounds egotistical, but it is a central place. I mean, at least uh, when you're immersed in my stories, I'm the one who is showing you what that place looks like. I'm going to finish by reading a passage, a, a passage that comes further in this. Sorry. 
um, that comes further in this in this piece that I've written. Um, when I went back to the farm, the piece is called Samir and the Samosas. Do you know? You, you probably know what a samosa is. It's, it's a sort of a, most cultures have this thing, which is you take a piece of uh, basically pastry and you put lots of delicious things into it and you close it and you drop it into oil. And it's, it's like every culture has a pizza and every culture has a samosa, except the Americans have neither. They've had to borrow both, which is, <laughs> which is so, so strange. Um, <laughs> or indicative, I don't know. I, I won't make any judgments. Um, uh, so the Samir, who was this fascinating character, he was, he was well, you'll, read, you'll hear about him in a minute, but he was the guy who was trying to take the farm away from my father. And, uh, and he had managed, uh, not he actually, but one of his henchmen had managed to actually become a member of parliament, which is you know, a very powerful position. So these guys were sort of, when I showed up, I mean, excuse the phrase, but I was completely candy ass. And, they were, and these guys looked at me and thought, this guy, we're going to eat him up. And, and, and they tried everything with me, as, as you'll read. Um, but the, this little section that I'm writing about, in Pakistan, everybody believes magic. Um, it's a kind of magic. Like, you know, whenever somebody's cow dies, it's because their neighbor who they're feuding with has sort of put an amulet in their, in their the cow's food or something like that. Um, so uh, I believe that, uh, I never understood, by the way, why they didn't just put poison in my food, because they were perfectly capable of it. Um, but they didn't, thank God. Otherwise, I would not be reading to you right now. Um, but uh, what I think they did do is try to use magic. Um, and I'm going to describe here how I think they tried to use magic. I had been at the farm perhaps six months arriving in the fall cotton picking season, the wheat planting season. Now the wheat had ripened, yellow-eared in the fields, and every day I sat in the farm stores and weighed the bags of threshed grain as they were brought bouncing in on trolleys, the farmhands perched atop the bags, ready to unload. The summer heat had struck here just across the Indus from the town of Sibi, supposed to have been the hottest place in the British Empire. That evening, I walked back to my house as the sun went over the horizon, my kurta salty with sweat, the sky muted with dust and heavily orange, as if the color weighed upon it. I did not allow Samir to come into the garden as he usually did in order to hash out the day's events. You go home. I've done enough business today. Showered, cooling, I sat in the garden and smoked the rough local cigarettes because I could not get imported ones closer than Lahore. A pedestal fan swung back and forth, blowing on me. Because I did not then have air conditioning, it would be too hot to sit inside. The major domo, Fazu, walked through the rooms of the house behind my back, snapping on the lights, a progressive transformation. I felt vulnerable and exposed. In my childhood, we always traveled with servants from Lahore. Fezu, who had haunted this house for years and years from before I was born, was not my familiar, had treated even my father with a propriety that substituted for his emotions, which were entirely locked behind a strange, ageless, beardless, Asiatic face and green eyes, the features of some long ago from the north again pressed into being. He would sell me out for a few sacks of wheat for nothing. Why shouldn't he? Everyone thought that I would soon be gone. Even my countenance betrayed me, not just my pale skin, palish, but, but my expressions, the indecision of my smile, the absence of cunning, and most of all, the absence of command, an American face. At the farm, I more and more lived according to routines, because only that way could I escape the paralyzing dread that sometimes came over me, the sense that I could trust no one, and that soon I would be driven away to do God only knows what, to leave Pakistan a failure and work in America. Fazu brought tea out to me now, 
as he did each evening in the center of the lawn, the air fragrant, fragrant with frangipani blossoms. And then, returning into the house, he came out with a platter covered with an embroidered handkerchief. Sorry. So he's just come out with the platter. What's this, I asked, sniffing the scent of fried food. I had decided, while living at the farm, to keep a strict diet. No booze, protein for breakfast and lunch, fruit for dinner, no snacks. At afternoon tea, Fazu was to give me exactly three biscuits. In the evening, none. Though I drank endless cups of tea and glasses of lemonade, I lived with a little growing hunger. Sorry, I lived with a little gnawing hunger, a mortification. Chaudhary Samir Sahib sent this from his own kitchen, made by his wife, answered Fezu. Samosas. They're very greasy. <laughs> I'll take just one, I said, lifting the white embroidered cloth, which was dabbed here and there with the oil that had soaked through. The samosas were smaller than they usually are, two bites, very crisp, and fragrant, but with a minty fragrance. I lifted one of the carefully folded delicacies, looked at it, and then crunched into it. Delicious. Hot beef, minced with spices, crumbled onto my tongue. Fezu had put the dish onto the table next to the tea things, and now I waved him away. That's fine, that's fine, I said. Six more of the samosas, <laughs> like browned pats of butter, sat on the dish. The crusts flaked off in dabs onto the plate, which had an oily sheen. Samir's wife had even taken the trouble to heat the platter to keep the treats warm. I washed my palate with milky tea, then lifted by its corner another of the dainty triangular morsels. Fabulous. This one had a different filling, little bits of potato, almost crunchy and so spicy that my eyes watered. Another bite and it was gone. I must stop. <laughs> Pouring myself more tea, adding milk and sugar, I eyed the platter, still charged with five delicate little samosas. Each one seemed particular, unique, itself. I laughed. For fuck's sake, I said to myself, don't be such a fucking prune. My stomach growled with eagerness. I took a sip of the newly powered tea, too hot, almost burning my tongue, then reached for another samosa. Different again. This one had a tomato chicken feeling, filling, sweetish but generous, generously peppered. I worked my way threw all the food on a platter, all the samosas, then finally, completely abandoning myself, licked the platter itself. <laughs> and even that had a complex, nutty flavor, the, f <laughs> the flakes of crust melting in my mouth. Sitting back, I took out a cigarette and lit it. I felt better. The chorus of birds that earlier had filled the garden now was silent and had been replaced by the sound of the night insects, a steady humming background with some different genus occasionally breaking in with an aria. The breeze came up. The moon came up over the high mud walls that surrounded the garden. All the dogs in the village barked, then fell silent. The food that the cook in the house prepared for me had no personality, no love in it. The cook used the most expensive ingredients, but assembled the food without care, without harmony of flavor. These samosas had been made with something akin to love, with close attention. I had not had any human contact, any loving contact, for six months <coughs> since I first came to the farm. But this food touched me had a message of concern in it, of interest, like a letter. I had never met Samir's wife, whom he could afford to keep in Parda, but I imagined the little courtyard in the manager's house, shaded and cemented, with a separate kitchen outside, and the fat woman, she would certainly be fat, who with clean, hennaed hands folded the paper-thin dough of the samosas. She dropped the filled, 
bulging savories, one by one into hot, boiling hot oil, the oil furiously churning. I imagine the spattering and popping oil, the ladle with which you removed the brown little morsels. Perhaps Samir sat by while she cooked, telling her to be careful to make them well. <laughs> Thank you. I will now entertain your questions. <laughs> uh, I'll try to be entertaining when I answer your questions. Um, so if, uh, if anybody has questions. It, it's a, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm writing a memoir. I'm sorry? I see. Uh, the, the question was, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, am I supposed to answer questions? Yes, yes, I am. OK, got it. Um, uh, <laughs> um, the question was, where was the last piece from? And the answer is, I'm writing a memoir, um, and uh, this is a piece out of it. So it's, 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 it's like, I, I, what I, when, I, when I write, I like to have several things going on at once, because uh, there are times when I can write one thing, or times when I can write another. Uh, it's, you know, writing is a question of place and space, and uh, something else that rhymes with it, but I'm not sure what. Um, uh, trace, trace. Um, uh, and, and, and therefore, I have several things going at once, and this is one of the things I have going. So it's from that. Please. The question was um, about the interdependence of lives in a feudal culture. Um, and I, I think that's what, in fact, defines a feudal culture, is that uh, you, you, you're not New Yorkers, but actually some, a bunch of you probably are. Um, <laughs> uh, but but uh, for those of you who aren't New Yorkers, you should know this about New Yorkers, that they will, of course, you do this as a trope, um, uh, that New Yorkers never know their neighbor. Um, so you can live next door to some guy and then only realize that he sort of went to college with you or something like that because people don't talk. Um, in Pakistan, you, I live, people ask me, why do you go back to Pakistan? Wha what is it that draws you? It's dangerous. It's, you know, there are many unpleasant aspects to it. Um, and the answer is that in Pakistan, unlike in America or the West, I'm connected with so many people. There are a thousand connections, um, literally, in my life. Um, perhaps the best, I mean, one of the ways to explain this is when to, to, to talk about when you go to the movie theater, which I used to as a kid, and they're selling tickets, and there are only a limited number of tickets, and the people won't line up. They sort of form this, like, a scrum that is, like, the only... The only way to describe it is like ants who are trying to get somewhere, and they're also crawling over each other. But they're very good-natured about it. You know, there's not, there's not. In in America, if somebody like started pushing you from in a bus line, you'd be pissed off at them. You'd tell them to get their hell off their hands off you. Instead of which, these guys are delighted to be sort of rubbing their bodies together as they <laughs> project their money towards the guy who's hidden in a cage because he knows this is going to happen. So he's the guy in the move. The guy selling the movie tickets is sitting in this sort of screen cage with a tiny little hole that you can't get your hand through. And then whoever like, gets forward most gets allow, is given the money and then he hands it back. And this is the way we live. Um, we live all over each other, uh, <laughs> and which, is, which, is, which is, and also in answer to, your, to get more precisely in answer to your question, uh, people in Pakistan are, there's a, there's a hierarchy, an extreme hierarchy. And what this means is that everybody is trying to get something from the guys above them or below them. And everybody knows where they stand, and everybody's trying to get a little higher. Um, and that means that you're just intimately connected. There's a wonderful saying, which, uh, which I think of a lot, which is that nothing binds man to man like the passage from one hand to another of cash, of gold. Um, and, and in Pakistan, 
th th these transactions are constantly happening because we, we, people live in these complex households where there are so many people in it and there are so many levels of it. Um, and living on my farm, there are so many levels of connection. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in America, a farmer is somebody who drives around on a tractor. Um, in Pakistan, a farmer is somebody who manages the sort of ecosystem of his farm. And, and, and that's a th that is a, this fascinating, disturbing, uh, obviously, I mean, I'm, 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 my politics are left, and obviously it's disturbing that I hold this role, hold this position, uh, this complex, disturbing, but incredibly plugged in life. Did that answer? <laughs> yeah, it's the beginning. <laughs> I'll write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Do you have a title for your book? I do, uh, but I don't think I'm going to tell it to you. <laughs> it, uh, but uh, you're going to be very disappointed. Everybody's going to be like, oh, no. Um, my book is about America. It has nothing to do with Pakistan. And I've set myself the project of not having the word Pakistan appear in the book. So it, it's an American book. Um, I'm hoping to finish it by, by the end of the year. Yep. Cool. The, 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 there's, a, uh, there's been in, in, in the I spent a lot of time thinking about the order in which the stories would appear in this book, um, a lot of time, and I spent a lot of time uh, sort of changing changing the stories in order to make the narrative of the whole book. It's it's a book of, for those of you who don't know, there's a, th it's a series of short stories which are all about sort of the same people, um, and. One of the things that I realize is that, <laughs> as people constantly keep telling me, is your book is so depressing. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, so th I d there was sort of about uh, two fifths of the way in, I decided that I needed to have some light entertainment, light. What's it called? Light relief, or relief, or something like that. Um, which is that there's just been this horrible story in which this woman became a drug addict and died. Um, uh, and and I and, and and it was generally depressing and down. And so I I decided what would be very funny would be to this, write this story in the voice of a corrupt judge. And, and you know, there's something just intrinsically funny in a t corrupt judge. Um, and 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 so so that's why I put that in. It was light relief, you know, to to, to sort of try to take off some of these. What you can imagine is these people sitting in sort of whatever and. So throwing the book down in tears, and I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? In back. Do, you, do I think the feudal agrarian world will continue? Uh, my mother had a phrase, which I believe in very strongly, which is three generations from shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve. And what that means is that, you know, well, they're not, you know, fancy people wear long sleeves. Let me just take it out. Um, <laughs> where, whereas, uh, whereas people who uh, you know, sort of live by the sweat of their brow or, um, wear short sleeves. Um, and usually what happens is that one generation earns it, one generation manages it, and one generation loses it. And in Pakistan, Pakistani feudalism is not like, say, English feudalism. I mean, in, in England, because there's law and order, uh, the, feudal, the, the feudal families are able to keep their property. In a place like Pakistan, what happens is there's a churn. Um, if, if, if I hadn't gone back to run my farm in Pakistan, then Samir, the guy in my story, would have become the next feudal, you see. Uh, I would have been off in America, sort of working as a lawyer, and he would have replaced me. So I think what you're seeing in Pakistan is that the the feudal structures aren't really changing, but the, the sort of the personalities are changing. So you get, you, know, you get new people coming up, which is very healthy. What you want is churn. Uh, um, you know, I mean Pakistan is a very screwed up place, but at least we do have the churn. 
that, that what happens is that the grandson is sort of buys himself a Ferrari and then runs it into a, like a wall in Lahore. And, and, uh, and he you know, can't manage his land and then he's done. And his kids have nothing. And that's, that, that's right. so the, the structures remain in place, the personalities change. Any other questions? Have we been long enough? Yeah, is it good? Uh, yeah, one more. No, no, we were lucky. Uh, we we were missed. But I went. I went there. I went to. I went. I flew back when I heard about the f when the floods were happening. I was happened to be in London, um, and uh, I flew back immediately. And uh, so I went around and looked at it. And it was something very interesting that happened, because I drove around and talked to people and tried to be helpful. Um, and what I, they were the, the scenes of devast. I mean, it was devastation. And there were these families who had nothing and then who now really had nothing and their animals had been lost and they lived by their animals and their crops had been destroyed. And so I started writing, very foolishly, I started writing all these editorial, or I wrote a couple of editorials, one in the Times and one in some London paper, um, saying that you know this was going to be a revolutionary moment, you know, millions of people had lost everything they had and that this was going to have a huge impact on Pakistan society. Uh, so then, about a year later, having thought about this, I decided I should go and re-explore the places where this flood had taken place. And what I discovered is that the people were doing fine. They had managed to rebuild their lives. And, and I, I was, had been a prophet of doom uh, and entirely wrong. Um, because these people never had anything. So what they lost didn't really matter. They just went back to their land and, and, and rebuilt. And a friend told me a story, which was the, the flood water hadn't even, uh, hadn't even receded. And there was this guy sitting there, there was you know, still water lying in his field. And he was rebuilding his house. And he's, the, guy said, the guy sort of cheerfully said, this is great, there's so much mud, you know, I can, it's easy to rebuild my house. <laughs> 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 so, so that was the floods. How are we doing? Done? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, the Pakistan is the only place where I've gotten really snarky reviews. Um, <laughs> the, pa the Pakistan, I I mean this is one of the terrible things about Pakistan, is that in Pakistan, and probably this starts from colonialism, but there's a, there's a feeling of being second rate. And when, when you, I mean, in America, when a writer succeeds, of course, there's snarkiness. But basically, everybody reads him and says, oh, well done. Um, in Pakistan, when somebody succeeds relatively, uh, uh, what the other people say is, you know, who the hell is he? Is he a fake? And he doesn't really know about Pakistan. Uh, I keep getting this one. How dare he write about the poor in Pakistan? Is this guy's always had food on the table. So, so, so there's that element. Um, the, there's only, I mean, hum, you know, there are not very many people in Pakistan who read slim volumes of sort of aesthetic uh, short stories. Um, so, so my audience is sort of friends and family, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're all snarky already. <laughs> um, in, in terms of impact, uh, my obviously my, story is not, my stories are not intended to be political in any way. But what I, and I didn't, had never, when I was writing them, it never occurred to me that there might be, uh, because I don't, I'm not political, I'm aesthetic when I write. Uh, it never occurred to me that there would be sort of a political repercussion. But I think what it would, it's been fascinating. You sort of take the story and let it go. And it's like sort of Moses in the boat. Uh, and it goes away and it has its own life. And it's not mine any longer. And the, the, the impact of the book can be very political. And m mine has not been particularly so. But among at least a certain educated uh, group of people, I think it's in Pakistan allowed them to enter the lives of, uh, of uh, poor Pakistanis in a way that they had never entered it before. Because I, I'm, I'm uniquely situated in that I live in the countryside. We, I spend most of my time living on this farm, which I love. Uh, and I meet all these guys. You know, I, as I told you that anecdote about gold, uh, that I spend a lot of time negotiating and meeting with 
people who people from the cities, the intellectuals, never meet. So I think may if it's had any impact, which would be political, it would be that one. Sorry. Is my farm impacted by the sort of troubles? Yes, uh, very much so. Um, it's becoming dangerous. It, it's becoming actually dangerous. When my, my wife is a blonde Norwegian, and when we live on our farm, when we live on our farm, we, I'm, I know for a fact that she's the only blonde person within 300 kilometers, at least. Um, so this makes her stand out a little bit. Um, and, 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 and so I feel personally vulnerable. Uh, and the, the, the law and order situation is terrible. So there are all sorts of repercussions of that. There are murders constantly. Uh, the police is gone. Uh, I, I, um, uh, people ask me, why don't you do, because I, I never do publicity in Pakistan. I, I, tr I don't, they ask me to be on TV and I refuse to be on TV and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and they say, why don't you do this? And I said, in Pakistan it's very unwise to be prominent without being powerful. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and I'm certainly not powerful. So these guys are screwing around with me all the time. Uh, you know, like my canal, uh, you know, in, in one piece of my land, the guys who are upstream from my canal, w w it's all canal fed where we are. Um, these guys are, are very strong. So what they do is that they just keep making holes in the canal and stealing all my water. Now, I can't do a damn thing about it. I'll, you know, I don't even bother to, to uh, sort of uh, complain because I know, I know who their, their allies are and there's no way I can do anything about it. Sorry, how are we doing for time? Ten. Minutes. Yeah, we're okay. Um, yep, in the back. Um, the government educational system is uh, is has completely fallen apart. When I went back to my farm, one of the first things I did was to obviously try to figure out what was going on with education, and I decided to try to partner. We had, my, my father was very into education, so so he we we had built he had built this boys high school, and then he'd also built this girls high school, um, on our land, uh, and and we were you know this was supposedly this wonderful thing, um, except what I realized when I got there as I started trying to partner with them is that these guys the the teachers never showed up, uh, the curriculum was especially after the Afghan war began the curriculum was just appalling in which it was full of lies. And kids can tell when you're lying to them. And the curriculum, you know, it was sort of like, uh, you know, all these, all these sort of, you know, nationalistic and, uh, you know, uh, pro, pro, uh, uh, you know, sort of geared towards the, the Afghan war, for example. And, and it was horrible. And then what we ended up doing, uh, uh, me and my wife now more, is uh, building a, our own school. Um, and that was interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, we found we, 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 I found that people wanted to get their daughters educated almost more than their sons, um, or at least equally. And the reason for that was that if, you, if the one way that a girl can marry up is if she's educated. Uh, and, and, and so these people were pushing their daughters on us because it's, it's tough for a boy to move up but it's easy for a girl to marry up. If she's pretty and educated, she might hook that doctor from town. Um, and, and so people are eager, people, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Some things are universal, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so and, and we've been running this school and having sort of relatively good success, but the educational system is completely broken. I mean, I can list for you the reasons why Pakistan is going to hell in the handbasket, and there are five or six of them, and one of them is obviously the educational system. It's falling apart. They, they, they always print these numbers, which is like, we have a 50% literacy rate. Well, that 50% literacy rate is a bunch of crap. Um, you know, th there's not 50% literacy. The lit you know, these, these guys go to 10th grade and still can't read. I know because I'm constantly hiring people and one of the things, obviously one of the first things I say to them is, oh, so can you read and write? And they're like, oh, yes, definitely. I'm 10th grade educated. And then I like put them like cat in a hat in front of them, and they don't know what the hell it means. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, I sh shouldn't be laughing. Um, uh, yeah. And now on 
what? <laughs> Message not received. <laughs> All the lawyers in this room are like, <laughs> right. Hugely, um, uh, very much. Uh, if you look through history at the well-known writers, you'll find that many of them are failed lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but there are several. Well, I'll answer you. There are several ways. One is that um, the, the most, the least way, is that uh, there are wonderful phrases that I've picked up from the law because these most of the judges who write these opinions are sort of artists manqué, you know, at least the good ones, like Judge Learned Hand. You just know that that guy had a novel in his drawer but never dared to show it to anybody. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, there, there's, and there, there are these wonderful phrases. One of my favorites is, um, so there's two drunks. This is in the torts you know, class. Um, there are two drunks who are walking along the railroad tracks, and there's a train that goes by, and the train has some piece of loose metal attached to it and bonks one of these guys in the head and kills him. So the judge is faced with the problem because he's obviously very, is this, I think it was learned then, he's very, very pro these two drunk tramps and he's trying to figure out why he, how he can cast their uh, little, um, they're sort of walking along the tracks in the most positive way. So he's, what he calls it is two companions on a social venture. <laughs> 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 they were heading for the next bar. <laughs> um, so there are these wonderful phraseology. Um, but, but more, more deeply, uh, I mean, th what lawyers do is either be very precise or be very imprecise in a very conscious way. Uh, and, and that is something that writers do. You know, we're either very precise or we, we create sort of points of information from which we allow the reader to extrapolate, and w which is a form of imprecision. Um, so, so one of the things I learned as a lawyer was to do that, to, to either be very precise or to be imprecise without the reader knowing that I'm being imprecise. Um, uh, the, the second thing that I learned that was really critical, I think, for me becoming a writer was that l lawyers have deadlines. Um, there was this horrible thing that used to always happen to me, which is really one of the reasons I quit, among others, which is that it's, it's 4.59, and I've got like a suitcase packed. I'm about to get on the Amtrak to go down and visit my brother, who's got this howling party arranged. And then, and then suddenly, and it was horrible, the phone would show you, it had the name of the person, the lawyer who's calling you. So it would be like some senior lawyer, and you see like it fly, and it always happened at 4.59. Um, and the name flash across, and you can't leave. The rule is five o'clock Friday, um, and it's summer, and it's green outside, and you're in this like air-conditioned place, and the glass is smoked, and it's horrible. Um, and yeah, you just want to get released. And then he comes in, Daniel. It's terrific. I've got this. I've got this fascinating thing for you. Why don't you just come on down? I'll show it to you. Um, and so you tromp down to trot down to this guy's place, and he says to you, you know, we got in a rule 14b11. Uh, it's, you're gonna love it. Um, we need you to know everything about it by tomorrow morning and write me a 10-page memo. And then you think, oh my God, my life is not worth living. But then you go back to your room and stay up all night and write this 10-page memo about Rule 14 B11. Um, lawyers are never blocked. You know, they never say, they never say gee, you know, uh, that I love 14 B11, I love the name. But, um, but <laughs> it's, it's not good for me right now. I don't feel it inside. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, so lawyers do can't do that. Um, so, so what happens is that you have to, when you have to k kick it out, you have to kick it out. Um, and that's because I think, you, you know, writers are such sort of lazy people. I mean, 80% of being a writer is sort of the musing. Um, and, 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 and so, and so you know, it's very important to have that training of just like get it out. Very long answer to a short question. <laughs> Two more. Um, yep. Farming is uh, the way I do it is a kind of a weird business because 
what I'm trying to do is sort of like, you know when you've got a top and you're trying to keep it spinning? So what you do is you hold the top of it and then you keep hitting it and it goes, zzz, keeps going around. Um, so that's my job. Um, uh, my job is to, to punish the evil and to reward the good. And, <laughs> and other than that, to, to keep the top spinning. Um, so, so what I, I mean, I just have a routine, which is I get up very early in the morning. I keep farmer's hours. Um, and I meet a bunch of people who are doing various tasks. Um, and then I say to them, carry on, brave men. Um, and they carry on, hopefully. Uh, and then, then, then I go and write until 2 o'clock. And at 2 o'clock, I have lunch with my wife. And then, we, uh, and then I, what I hate doing is the books, which is what I mostly do, because the books are where the true uh, crimes are committed. Um, uh, and uh, when I, what I prefer to do is go out and walk on the land. With I don't know a damn thing about farming, so it's quite funny when I'm sort of strolling around saying, hey, tell me about this weed. And I say, actually, that's oats. Um, <laughs> 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 and then I sort of like, oops, oh yeah, I meant oats, you know, it's a misfit. So, so, and then I farm till evening. And there's nothing to do at my farm. Uh, there are no opera houses or restaurants or anything like that. My nearest friend is three hours away. Um, so, so, you know, we farm till evening and then I uh, read and go to sleep. Last question, please. This is the most, uh, the question is, um, uh, am I going to be able to hold on to my farm for the next generation? Um, uh, this is the most fraught, con fraught uh, issue in my life. Um, I love this place. I live by this place. I've bled for this place. I've laughed at this place. Um, and the question is, because farmers are people who love land. And, and we love, I don't feel that I own the land. I'm, I'm a steward of the land, uh, and I try to manage it in the most humane and the most you know, intelligent way. But that only has, you know, il faut cultiver nos jardins. But what does that mean if I make a beautiful garden and then it's not preserved by somebody? So I want to pass it on. On the other hand, the political situation is so screwed up that I think there's a great chance that I won't be able to pass it on. I think there's even a great chance that I'll uh, may be driven away. Uh, and so, you know, that's, I don't know how to answer that. I hope, but I worry. Thank you very much. Thank you again, everyone. Please join us in the lobby. Explorers selling books, and Danielle will be there signing them. You can ask more questions. Thank you.